Welcome to another lively edition of the deadly experiment, all of you out there. TV land, those of you who watch us on local public access cable television in Rhode Island on Channel 13 Cox and 32 Verizon, those of you who watch these programs later on YouTube, uh, all of you um, certainly uh, are entreated to a very special program today in this particular episode of The Deadly Experiment. I should say, first of all, how did we get the name, The Deadly Experiment? Going back, for those of you new viewers, and we have so many people who say the first time they've ever seen the show or they've ever come across us, and we thank God for that. But the as you know, the name of Rhode Island after Roger Williams was named the Lively Experiment. And Roger Williams was that experiment in freedom, freedom of religion, not freedom from religion, but freedom of religion, and particularly Christian, that is the Christian faith, freedom of conscience, freedom to soul search, freedom to, to worship God as you please. And essentially, we were given this lively experiment many, many, many years ago, several centuries back. Now, of course, we are no longer a lively experiment, but we are a deadly experiment. And so we did the flip side of the name, the lively experiment, calling it the deadly experiment, and taking deadly aim at the enemies of our God, our people, and our heritage. And this is why we are the deadly experiment, taking a deadly aim at Satan, his children, and his influences across this planet, not just here in Rhode Island. Roger Williams created a colony of religious liberty, a colony where men were free to worship God as they pleased. He did not welcome everyone into the state. He did not welcome the homosexuals. He did not welcome, oh, don't tell Ruth Bader Ginsburg that in the Supreme Court. She wouldn't be very happy. But in any event, um, so be it, as it says, so be it. You know, folks, he created a colony of choice, of choice for freedom to think, freedom to worship God, not to worship the devil, not to create, a, 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 if you will, a denizen of darkness in a sea of darkness. He created, out of Massachusetts Bay Colony, this experiment in liberty, soul liberty, if you will. And now today, Centuries later, we have no such concept of liberty anymore because today we are a humanistic, socialistic, secularistic uh, nation and people devoid of any real foundation in the whole meaning of Christianity and Roger Williams. Don't forget, the time in which we speak has no relevancy to today. Centuries ago, Men were deeply religious, deeply held beliefs and so forth. Many of them took the form of torture, just as they do today, take the form of torture and brutality and criminality. But men like Roger Williams, who were Baptist, essentially, free-thinking Baptist, were those who believed in the eternal God. They believed in Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ. They believed in his freedom to worship him, to be with him, to live by his rules, and not to engage in raucous or revelous behavior. So Roger Williams created a colony of freedom, freedom to think, freedom to choose, to buy land, as it were. And he bought land legally from the Indians. He did not steal land, despite what some would have you believe. Roger Williams was a man of honor. He was a man of integrity. And here we have today a state which is governed by people who lack integrity, who lack any kind of moral conviction whatsoever. Today we are ruled by tyrants, by despots, by secularists, by humanists, by homosexuals, by socialists in every sense of that word. And you know, it's interesting to note in our history of Rhode Island that we had three big statewide officials known statewide, if not ruling by statewide decree, who all wound up going to jail, shamed in their office. And one of them was, in fact, the governor of Rhode Island. His name was Ed Depreet. Ed Depreet, unbeknownst to many now, 
was the first governor who signed the first proclamation of an anti-discrimination ordinance in the state of Rhode Island pursuant to homosexuals. He proudly signed that decree. And it wasn't long after that Ed Dupreet was convicted of corruption charges and went to prison, served a prison term, disgraced in office. Then we have the case of Mr. Cianci, who was mayor of the city of Providence. And he proudly hoisted, when it was opportunistic for him, the flag of the homosexuals atop City Hall, again an affront to Roger Williams and his specific statements against the homosexuals. So, Buddy Cianci wound up getting convicted and going to jail, federal prison. Then we have the case most recently of Gordon Fox, the Speaker of the House, who also proclaimed openly his homosexual preference and married a man. Incredible, but it all happened. He too now is in federal prison. Now, friends, let me tell you, it's just the beginning. God has his way of exacting his vengeance upon people when they do things openly and in view of everyone with uh, a state or city imprimatur upon them. In other words, they're giving their official blessings to these sort of things. And when they do that, they wind up paying a heavy price. And let me tell you, it is just the beginning. Now, as we do this specific program today, this special edition of the program, One thing that we want to concentrate on on this program is what will it be like in the end times that we're now in for the world itself. We know in the Word of God, in the book of Revelation, what to expect with regard to the seals, the seven seals. The first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth and the seventh. Now, the sixth seal has to do with Satan, and the sixth trumpet has to do with Satan's rule. Hence, we have six, six, six. Six is Satan's number. Seven is the number attributed to God Almighty. The seventh trump comes after the sixth trump of the book of Revelation. And we read all of this in the first few chapters of Revelation, chapter 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 and 7. And then in chapter 9, we read how Satan was, you know, originally given a seven-year cycle, three and a half years of war and tribulation for the elect, and then would be three and a half years of peace, meaning false peace. Well, no, friends, that was shortened in the book of Revelation, and in chapter 9, we read where those days were shortened to a period of 42 months. And folks, that is how Satan's numbers are registered. His days are not days as the day of the Lord, God Almighty, but Satan is measured in months, months, and in the lunar calendar, the lunar calendar ticks, so to speak. And this is why you have the lunar years, we have the blood moons, the feasts, and so forth that speak of these events of the end times. Satan is in months, God is in days. The day of the Lord, the seven-day week, the six days, and the one day of rest, the Sabbath day. Seven is God's number. Mathematically, That is the Word of God. It is a book of mathematics. It is a book of science. It is a book of archaeology. It is a book of geography. And it is a book of history as well as the future. Now, we are in those days described by Daniel the prophet, Isaiah the prophet, and all of the minor prophets, including Micah and Zephaniah and Zechariah, and all of those who have told us what to expect in these days. And in these days today that we live, one city is mentioned in the Bible as the city of the end-time prophecy. No, it isn't Rome, believe it or not. It's not Medina, believe it or not. The city is Jerusalem, or Jerusalem, since it is no J in the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet. It is known as Jerusalem, God's eternal city. That's the city in the first world age 
was created as God's capital. That is, the age that was before this age in which we live today. Yes, there was a world before this world. Read about it. Of course, it's first mentioned in Genesis 1 and then Genesis 2. And in fact, the world became void, not was void, but God created the heaven and the earth. And that earth was indeed populated. It was populated by animal life, by creatures, these huge leviathans of which we see the archaeological remains, and of souls in the earth in spirit form. Now, God was obligated to destroy that first earth age because in that age, everybody at that particular time was in a state of rebellion, virtually all but his elect in a rebellion against God and his commandments, his order. So he did destroy the age, the world system, rather than destroy all of the souls in that age. Those souls were now transmuted into this second earth age, the flesh age, the age where now men are born of woman, so that we come through the birth canal, we enter the world as flesh and blood, not as spirit beings. And that's why the Bible makes it clear that man born of woman doth have a short time to live in this age. See, the Bible is so true, it is so perfect, that it cannot be countermanded or counter or uh, contradicted. So, folks, what we're seeing go on today is exactly what we saw go on in the first world age. It's happening again. Men are lining up for God. Men are lining up against God. And this age will be consummated and finally ended when Jesus Christ returns to the earth and he will set foot the Mount of Olives. Now, Jerusalem, or Jerusalem, is that city. That city that you see before you now. That city that looks so beautiful at night. So beautiful sometimes during the day. And yet it is a city that will be ruling the world through the man of sin, Antichrist. Right now his children planted that fig tree. Satan's children in 1948. The Bible says, and Jesus himself in Matthew 24, right here, tells us that generation shall not pass. This generation of what? The fig tree. Until all of these things be fulfilled. We have seven major events taking place. All of them have already been fulfilled, including worldwide destruction and war, except the last. And the last is what is known as the abomination of the desolator. In Ezekiel chapter 38, Ezekiel 39, we see the desolator, not the desolation. It is the desolator, Satan himself, coming to rule in this city worldwide, not just geographically including that area surrounding the Middle East, but the entire planet, the entire world shall be under his domain. Now, when he comes, he will come following the destruction of the one world beast system that we have before us today. In other words, this whole global union this whole global enterprise today that we speak of when we hear about the man of sin coming to heal the nations of the world. Right now, what's happening in the Eurozone and what has happened by the time you watch this program is indicative of what is going to happen here in the United States and what is going to happen all the nations of Europe, what is going to happen throughout the entire world, including Asia, and the Pacific, South America, North America, Central America, all of the continents and nations of the world, folks, including Australia, New Zealand, and the rest of them. What we are witnessing is a global economic calamity, something we spoke about on this program some 11 and a half years ago. You know, we're in our 12th year of doing this program, The Deadly Experiment. Would you believe that? 12 years now, we have been sent to do this work. Messengers from the Bible telling you what God is going to do in these last days. That's right. We don't claim to be 
God or prophets because prophecy has already ended. All prophets are now dead. In Christ they live, but they are now dead in the soil, in hell. Hell means the grave. That's all that means is the grave. Whether it's the word Sheol you want to use, or the word Tartarus you want to use, or Gehenna, the, the burning garbage heap in Jerusalem, it does not matter. All of them mean the same thing, Hades included. The grave. Now the body goes into hell, the grave, as Jesus' body did, and then rose again on the third day. So the spirit, when one dies, goes back to be with God. It doesn't matter who it is. You're going back because it's he who gave life. Not you, but he who gave life. You're going back to him on one side of the great gulf or on the other side of the great gulf spoken of in the book of Revelation as well. The great gulf that divides the saved from the lost and you're not necessarily lost until after the period of time known as the millennium when God through Yeshua Messiah and his saints rule the world for a thousand years to bring about true salvation. After that comes the season of the end, when men must line up after knowing the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, to make their choice either for Yeshua Messiah or against him. Those who are already past can, in fact, learn of this message of salvation through their loved ones, through those who are on the earth, will be a period of conversation, a period of communication, so that no one is left out of God's plan. Everyone, every soul, he will pour out his spirit on all flesh. And he will pour out his spirit on all souls. Souls past and souls living when he comes to rule. This city of Jerusalem, you see, is the city that God established in the first world age. And in the second world age, right now, the generation of which we speak, the generation of the fig tree, is the city occupied right now by the sons of Cain, those who were the murderers of uh, everyone from righteous Abel down to that of Zacharias, who was slain between the altar and the temple. There's no doubt about it. In her was found the blood. In whom? In Cain's seed line. Read about it in Revelation 17 and Revelation 18, friends. No mistaking who it is. No, it's not the Catholic Church. It's not the Vatican that did not exist five or 6,000 years ago. But it is, in fact, the seed line, which would control the city of Jerusalem in the last days. The bad fig tree is planted here in this city to rule because Satan must assume his throne. Now, it tells us that. He who sitteth in the temple shall rule the world, coming as the false Christ, the false Messiah, the false Jesus. The false Jesus comes just before the real Jesus. He comes when this world system collapses. Iron and clay do not hold, they do not mix. And the one world system, the beast system, and the Christians and the nations of the world cannot bind together in a one world government structure. Not for long. It will be tried. It is tried now. They're working on it. The IMF, the World Bank, the internationalists have created, that is the synagogue of Satan, has created the conditions to bankrupt the nations of the world through loaning money that does not exist, loaning credit. It's interesting to note, you see, going back in time, that when we were fighting in Vietnam and in Korea, that those nations only were sustained, the communist nations, by the Exim Bank and the uh, Export-Import Bank and the World Bank in terms of loans that were lent to communist countries that then, behind the Iron Curtain, were financing these communist countries in Southeast Asia, allowing them to stay afloat. And the armaments that were going to the Viet Cong through Haiphong Harbor, so forth, were all provided by the same cabal of people who brought us into the disaster of World War II and the disaster of World War I, out of which sprang the Second World War. So you see, folks, all destruction, all evil, all of this filth, 
of worldwide war, worldwide conflicts over land, over territory, over resources, all of it goes back to the same seed line mentioned in Genesis 3.16 onward. You can't get away from it. That's why the Bible checks itself. Genesis, Revelation, and all in between, all of them connect to the Word of God from beginning to end. And this is why when we get into all of the books of the scriptures from the old to the new, there is no contradiction. There's no division. One fulfills the other. When the Kenite sons of Cain tried to tempt Jesus in this city, to tempt him to kill the woman who was caught in the act of adultery, physical adultery, he said, have you not written? I read, it is written. Have you not, have you not read? He always referred back to the Old Testament. He always referred back to the law and the law of Moses and the law of forgiveness. And that mercy seat in Jerusalem today is that same mercy seat that God created in the first world age. And who wanted that mercy seat? Why, of course, Lucifer, Satan himself, the cherubim who was in charge of guarding that seat. He committed the sin that some will commit that will cost them their souls. And you know what that sin is? The sin of wanting to be God. The sin of wanting through pride, through vanity, through ego, to wanting to be equal with God. Friends, there's no way around this. There's only one God. He created all that is for his own pleasure. He said that he did create everything, including the elements and the earth and the soil from which we came. Man was created from the earth, from the dust of the earth, earth to earth, dust to dust. This is where we go. When the body dies, it goes back to the earth. He created it all, the universe. So today, men are trying to prove that it just all happened with a Big Bang or some sort of other evolutionary process. That is impossible. It cannot happen. That's why when evolution is thrown into a computer to test the theory of evolution, it comes out void every single time. It cannot be created. It cannot be replicated in any computer system. It does not make sense. Evolutionism, that is the evolving through a process of billions and trillions and quintillions of years from something that was nothing is impossible. That is, you cannot create living matter from inorganic matter. And obviously, if you did, you would now have to find billions upon billions of intermediary links between them and all of the stages of life, including insect, including animal, including human. All of this as well as the very organic processes of plant life itself. So friends, there is no evolutionism. There is no such thing as atheism in the end. It is either one side or the other, for Christ or against Christ, because he created all. And it's his universe, and that city of Jerusalem is the city of Antichrist in this age. Now, as we approach the last few minutes of today's program, the most important question that you have to face is, how can you tell the real from the fake Jesus? You see those images? The real Jesus or the fake? Now, you're probably saying to yourself right now, but wait a minute now, how do I tell him apart? Doesn't this fake Jesus come with with a pitchfork and big horn sticking out of his head and an ugly, grotesque appearance on his face. Sort of like some of the politicians we have running <laughs> our country today. No, 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 no. A thousand times he comes as the most beautiful creature on the face of the earth to deceive the world. And he will deceive the world. The whole world shall be deceived, Jesus said, except mine elect, those who are sealed with the seventh seal, the seventh seal. 
and the seventh trumpet is when Jesus returns, taking out the sixth trumpet. The sixth trumpet is Satan's coming back to the earth in flesh form, in a body, in a temple, in what city? Jerusalem. He comes to rule this world, but he doesn't look like all of those horrid images that you see on those stupid horror movies and those crazy futuristic movies about the man of sin, the Antichrist, and Satan. No, he comes as the most beautiful looking creature on the face of the earth. Now it says in the Bible that Jesus himself was not the most handsome person to look at, that he was not. I'm sorry to tell you that, but it says that, that for a reason Jesus was in fact not the most beautiful Mr. America. He was trying to convey the message, and he did, to his followers, but he was not a beautiful Mr. America. No, in fact, he wasn't. It was his message and his inner beauty that captivated souls, and that's the whole point. Satan comes looking as the most beautiful Jesus you can imagine. He is Lucifer. He is the lawless one, the son of perdition. Perdition means death. That means doomed to death. And that's where Satan is going, to death. And that's where you don't want to go. Hopefully, one-third of the souls who chose Satan in the first world age will be shown the other way, and many will change, we hope. Two-thirds, we know one-third was with God. The other third, eh, on the fence, you know, maybe yes, maybe no. We want to see them converted and the wicked ones, those who chose Satan in that first world age, we certainly don't want to see them perish as well, including the Kenites, including the sons of Cain, given their chance to repent and change course. You see, God is not unfair. God is not cruel. Despite what you think and the impression many of you have gotten from this program, no, we tell you the truth. The truth is in this age, we're in the flesh age. Certain things have to come to pass. But three strikes and you're out in the next world age, which would begin when the real Jesus comes after the fake Jesus and dethrones him and establishes 1,000 year millennial rule to witness to all the nations of the world. That's the one that counts. Three strikes and you're out. So what's the determining factor of the real Jesus? Real Jesus wants your love. He wants you to worship him and the Father as the creator, to reduce yourself to the most humble level you can and worship him. You see, ego and pride, these are one of the, the seven deadly sins that are mentioned in the scriptures here. That's right, pride of life, the pride of the flesh, the lying tongue, the divisiveness, the one who gossips in the assembly against others, the false witness. These are the sins that God has big problems with, real big issues with. You don't want to be guilty of them. Humility gives way to salvation. So hope, hopefully today this program has edified some, brought some to the knowledge of the truth, and we certainly want to see and hear from you if we can help you. This is The Deadly Experiment, Rick Adams, your host and producer for The Deadly Experiment, thanking you all for joining us on this special edition in which we say God's elect will be blessed in this age. And his elect, the 7,000 Zadok, that Z you see on the screen, that means the justified ones in the first world age. May God bless them and heaven shine upon his elect. Goodbye and Yahweh bless.